the founder and director of the John Paul II Forum. And it's through the John Paul II Forum we've been blessed with a great speaker at a workshop who's giving this talk tonight, Don Eden. The John Paul II Forum is an apostolic endeavor that uh, seeks to educate and to elaborate on the legacy of St. John Paul II. And we do workshops and lectures and various events to um, honor that great legacy of John Paul II. And we are grateful both to the Strake Foundation and the Scanlon Foundation for support. But I would ask my colleague and member of the board of the John Paul II Forum, Roman, uh, Roland Miliare, who is a teacher at St. Pope John XXIII High School and is finishing his doctoral work at Mundelein Seminary, where he had the honor and privilege of working alongside um, Dr. Goldstein. And I'd ask him to introduce our speaker. Roland? To introduce our speaker this evening, I thought I'd begin with this quotation from a Carthusian monk. It is not a question of loving what is evil or painful, but of suffering it in order either to set it right or to bring it to an end. That is God's way. He doesn't love evil, but he permits it for the sake of the good he draws out of it. Evil, like all reality, is a marvelous instrument in the hands of divine providence. We shall be amazed one day in the next world to see what suffering will have accomplished in courageous souls who know how to accept it and bear it out of love. It is the deepest source of true peace. For that we must be strong, but being strong does not mean resisting what is wounding us to rid ourselves of it. There is another and much higher kind of strength. It is that strength which accepts what it cannot get rid of, remaining all the while smiling under the cross. It is not to the cross that we smile, but to him who carried it before us and for us, and who carries it with us still. Dr. Don Eden Goldstein has shared the good news of this deepest source of true peace throughout her writings and the witness of her life, rooted in the healing grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, remaining all the while smiling under the cross. Dr. Goldstein, who writes under the name Don Eden, is the author of Remembering God's Mercy, Redeem the Past, and Free Yourselves from Painful Memories, The Thrill of the Chase, and My Peace, I Give You Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints. She was born into a Jewish family in New York City, although for a brief period of time she did live in the great state of Texas on Galveston Island, which we had the privilege of visiting yesterday, visiting the uh, temple, uh, the congregation she grew up in, B'nai Israel. And during her teenage years, she lost her faith and became an agnostic. And during her 20s in the 1990s, she was a rock journalist in New York City, interviewing oldies artists such as Brian Wilson and Henry Nilsson. She went on to work in editorial positions for the New York Post and the Daily News. And at the age of 31, Dr. Goldstein underwent a dramatic conversion to Christianity that ultimately led her to enter the Catholic Church. Her books have been featured in the New York Times and El Observatorio Romano and on EWTN. Dr. Goldstein recently received her doctorate in sacred theology from the University of St. Mary of the Lake in Mundelein, Illinois. And her dissertation was on the recent magisterial teaching on redemptive suffering. Dr. Goldstein also made history in the Archdiocese of Chicago, receiving the honor of being the first woman to receive a pontifical, decree, pontifical doctorate at Mundelein. Dr. Goldstein has spoken about spiritual healing and conversion to thousands of people throughout North America and abroad. So please give her a warm Texas welcome as she shares her message with us this evening on how divine mercy heals our memories.
thanks so much, uh, Roland uh, and uh, Dr. Hittinger, for for uh, those uh, wonderful introductions. And uh, I'm grateful to uh, to all from the uh, John Paul II Forum for making uh, my week here uh, in Houston possible. I've been teaching a class uh, at St. Mary's Seminary. Uh, uh, sponsored, I think, by the University of St. Thomas and the John Paul II Forum um, on uh, John Paul II's teachings on redemptive suffering. And uh, now it's my joy to share with you tonight the message of my latest book, Remembering God's Mercy, Redeem the Past and Free Yourself from Painful Memories. Uh, as you heard from Roland, uh, I spent... Uh, much of my childhood in Galveston. I lived there from when I was three to when I was 12. And yesterday had the opportunity to, to uh, go back there uh, for the first time um, since a few years after I moved uh, from there. So really uh, the first time uh, in, um, in uh, close to uh, 35 years. Uh, and this is also my first time uh, in Houston in that time, although I've had the pleasure of speaking elsewhere in Texas uh, on, uh, on uh, other uh, books that I've written. And you know, I have to say that uh, from the uh, point of view of uh, my own uh, experience as uh, a convert, you know, being able to come here to Houston for the first time as a Catholic and to experience the, the richness of Catholic life here it's such a joy, and also uh, from the point of view of someone who speaks about uh, redemption, reparation, uh, redemptive suffering, uh, there's something very special for me about uh, coming to a city that I last visited um, long before I was baptized, a and uh, being able to, to come to a, a place where, you know, in some way, um, in, in some way, I, I must have, in the past, put something bad in, in here, even if it was only my own, um, uh, my own uh, bad thoughts. And being able, by God's, with, with God's grace, to put something good here. And it's your presence here that enables uh, any good that I'm able to do uh, here. So I'm, I'm most grateful for that. So I want to tell you a little about Remembering God's Mercy, about why uh, I wrote it, and then read to you a bit uh, from it, uh, and then take your questions. And all of this should take us up to probably about, well, the, the part of sp telling you about the book and, and, and reading from it should take us up to about um, uh, five or ten minutes to eight, and then after that, uh, answering questions for as long as you have them. Uh, so. Uh, why I wrote Remembering God's Mercy? Well, um, as you heard, my first book was on chastity, The Thrill of the Chaste. Then my second book was My Peace I Give You, Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints. And uh, that book I wrote because I, as someone who came into the church with certain wounds uh, from my past, including uh, the wounds of childhood sexual abuse, I saw a need for a book giving a Catholic understanding of healing uh, for adults who had suffered childhood sexual abuse. And the uh, approach that I took was uh, on finding healing through the lives of saints who also suffered abuse or trauma and who found healing through uniting uh, their, own wo their own wounds to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the glorified wounds of Jesus. And uh, the response to my peace I give you uh, was, uh, praise God, uh, very po positive. Um, and uh, among, among the people who responded to it are people um, I, I got to make long distance friends whom I've met just tonight from the Maria Goretti Network, which is a Catholic uh, group that meets here uh, that's, that's, uh, that's made up of survivors of, uh, of childhood sexual abuse or any kind of uh, abuse, uh, who meet to support one another uh, in, in Christ. Uh, and uh, they and other readers of my piece I give you 
pointed out to me that the spirituality that I was giving in it of redemptive suffering and, and healing in Christ uh, could be applied to people who need healing from any kind of wound, not just the wound of abuse. And many people, in fact, told me that they wanted to give my peace I give you to family and friends who had not uh, suffered, uh, suffered abuse, but that what they would really like was something uh, that was not so uh, targeted uh, for uh, for sexual abuse, but that could uh, be applied more universally, more generally. Uh, so that was the motivation for me to write Remembering God's Mercy, but I didn't want to just say all the things that I had said before, but m speaking more generally. So to give it a different angle, um, I took advantage of the fact that we have now a pope who speaks quite a bit about spiritual healing and particularly about healing of memories. Uh, pope Francis has this wonderful Jesuit spirituality that he brings uh, into the papacy and, and brings that particularly to speaking about uh, healing uh, from uh, the pain of the past. Uh, so, uh, so I brought Francis's spirituality into remembering God's mercy and in particular I was inspired by something that he said in his first uh, major interview, uh, being interviewed by uh, Father Anthony Spadaro, a fellow Jesuit, he, he, he was asked uh, what was his favorite method of prayer. And Francis said, for me, prayer is always a prayer full of memory. So since I'd written about healing of memories already, you can imagine hearing that line, a prayer full of memory, just captivated me and made me want to learn what does Francis mean by prayer full of memory. Uh, so I'm going to read you uh, a section of my piece I give you that talks about what Francis means by prayer full of memory. But before I do that, uh, I want to read to you uh, a true story uh, that happened uh, when I was speaking about my piece I give you. So this is a true story about a challenging question that I was asked while giving a talk and how I responded, uh, taking into uh, account the uh, teachings of Pope Francis. So uh, this is from uh, chapter, uh, I believe it's chapter three, yes, sharing in Mary's grace of memory. And uh, I write, Shortly after I began writing this book, in April 2015, I traveled to South Dakota to speak on healing of memories at a small Catholic parish on a Native American reservation. Much healing was needed there. The reservation was known for its high rates of child abuse, drug abuse, and suicide. I had just finished giving my talk when a middle-aged woman in the front row raised her hand to ask a question. She was clearly hurting, her brow was furrowed, and her speech was halting. As she tried to get her words out, I admired her courage in publicly revealing her pain. Is there anything in the Bible, she began. Good, I thought, a Bible question. I know my Bible, so I should be on safe ground. Anything in the Bible about people who recover their memory, about people who block out their memories of trauma and then get their memories back. Whoa. I had to pause and reflect. No one had ever asked me a question like that. A year earlier, before I began researching the thought of Pope Francis, the question would have left me stumped. There is no doubt that the Bible relates many traumatic experiences from Adam and Eve's expulsion from Eden all the way up to Jesus' passion and the sufferings of the early Christians. But how could it have anything to say about remembering forgotten pain? Wasn't that a modern phenomenon, something that became known only after post-traumatic stress disorder entered the public vocabulary 
in the 1980s? No, it wasn't. It was, I realized, in fact, a very old phenomenon. The woman's question touched upon an important theme of the New Testament, one that holds particular significance for Francis. There are, I began, many incidents in the Bible where a person blocks out a traumatic memory and only recalls it later. We see it all through the Gospels. Think of all the times when Jesus, as he heads toward Jerusalem, tells his disciples that the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected and scourged and spit upon and killed and rise again on the third day. It was traumatic for the disciples to hear that. First of all, they didn't have a concept of a suffering Messiah. They were expecting a warrior Messiah, one who would take back Israel from the Roman occupation. So the idea of a suffering Messiah scandalized them. What's more, the disciples loved Jesus more than they loved anyone. Hearing him predict his own death was as though they were hearing their own father tell them he would be beaten, humiliated, and killed. It was too much for them to handle. So what did they do? They blocked it out. And so when Jesus' predictions of his passion came true, the disciples were blindsided, having never expected that their leader would be taken away from them, they scattered. And with that, we see the real problem that happens when people block out memories of past trauma. Practically every time Jesus predicted his passion, he would also say that after three days, he would rise. But because the disciples blocked out their memories of Jesus' predictions of his passion, they also blocked out his predictions of his resurrection. So when he was crucified, their hope was gone. But what happens after Jesus rises? Pope Francis points out in one of his homilies that when Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb expecting to find Jesus and instead found it empty, the angel said to them, remember what he told you when he was with you in Galilee. And they remembered his words. The first thing Jesus does when he rises from the dead is that he restores our memory. Jesus' encounter with the disciples on the road to Emmaus demonstrates this beautifully. The two disciples don't recognize him as, as he approaches them. They are speaking to one another uh, about what just happened in Jerusalem, Jesus' crucifixion. When Jesus asks what they are discussing, their faces become downcast. They look at the ground. Isn't that like what we do when we are traumatized? We don't want other people to see our expression. The disciples tell Jesus about the events of the Passion but they speak as though they had no hope. They even say that some women went to the tomb and reported that Jesus was alive, 
but they themselves have no memory of Jesus saying he would rise. They blocked out his predictions of his death because they couldn't imagine a suffering Messiah. You see this in their saying, but we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Jesus could respond by immediately revealing his identity to the disciples, but he doesn't. Instead, before showing them who he really is, he first heals their memories. He uses the words of the prophets to remind them of what he himself had said to them during his earthly life, that the Messiah would enter into his glory through suffering. So uh, that was the answer that I gave uh, this woman uh, on the, uh, in that talk on the reservation. And in that chapter of Remembering God's Mercy, uh, I talk further about how um, that woman uh, did me a great favor by asking me that question because she enabled me to go deeper into Pope Francis's writings. I went back and I studied what Francis said about the, 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 about the women at the tomb and the angel saying to them, remember what he told you. And uh, that enables me to explore more deeply uh, how the risen Jesus heals our memories. Um, but rather than go into that right now, there are two other just uh, segments that I'd like to read to you from Remembering God's Mercy, just to give you a little taste, a little smorgasbord <laughs> of, what's, uh, of what's in here, um, and uh, also to give you just some other uh, fruit for, for contemplation. Uh, so uh, what I'd now like to do is move to uh, chapter one, which is where I go into uh, what Francis means when he speaks of his own prayer as a prayer full of memory. In that interview uh, with th that, he, that he gave for um, Father Anthony Spadaro, he, he specifies that his uh, idea of a prayer full of memory is based on two different um, moments in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. And I talk about those moments in, um, in chapter one uh, of remembering God's mercy. And those moments have to do with um, two uh, particular prayers that Ignatius Loyola uses in the spiritual exercises. Has anyone here ever done the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius? A few hands. That's, that's great. I, I recommend the a, at least the eight-day exercises if you can ever uh, do do those with a, a good spiritual director. doesn't have to be a Jesuit, although it certainly helps. Uh, and uh, so uh, here's what I say about these two prayers that uh, Francis, uh, that Francis says um, inspire his own prayer full of memory. Um, Francis uh, has talked uh, uh, particularly about this uh, prayer that Ignatius employs in the spiritual exercises called the Anima Christi, Soul of Christ. Uh, Francis once, uh, before he was Pope, um, in a talk to his fellow Jesuits, observed that in the Anima Christi, Ignatius places us in contact with the Lord's sanctifying body in such a way that we are hidden in his wounds and thus have our own wounds and sores healed. In the spiritual exercises, Ignatius instructs the retreatant to place himself in the presence of Jesus and make the prayer, soul of Christ, sanctify me, body of Christ, save me, blood of Christ, inebriate me, water from the side of Christ, wash me, Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within thy wounds, hide me. Uh, the prayer uh, goes on. Um, uh, it says, 
suffer me not to be separated from thee. Uh, and it continues. Um, but what you can see just from these uh, few lines is that, uh, as I write, this is a prayer that bespeaks intense intimacy with Christ. Uh, the intimacy is real. It is physical. It is enfleshed. At the same time, the Anima Christi's imagery doesn't stop at Jesus' humanity. It reaches all the way to his divinity. When we ask Jesus to hide us in his wounds, we realize, as Francis has said, that body, those wounds, that flesh, all are intercession. It is through the wounds of Christ, Francis says, that we encounter the Father. Uh, and Francis spoke more about this in his first Divine Mercy Sunday homily as Pope. Uh, he, he's uh, shedding light on the passage in John's Gospel where the risen Christ shows his wounds to Thomas. Uh, and he talks about how Jesus' interaction with the doubting apostle is an example of how God responds to our weakness with his patience. Uh, Francis says, this is the reason for our confidence, our hope, for we too can enter into the wounds of Jesus we can actually touch him. This happens every time that we receive the sacraments with faith. But, Francis adds, we must have the courage to trust in Jesus' mercy, to trust in his patience, to seek, uh, to seek refuge always in the wounds of his love. Um, there, there's more that I have to say about Francis and the Anima Christi. Um, I'll, I'll leave you with that for now um, to, um, to talk about uh, the other prayer from the spiritual exercises that Francis cites uh, in his uh, description of his own prayer full of memory. And this other prayer is uh, the Sushipe prayer, which, unlike the Anima Christi, is uh, a prayer that Ignatius wrote himself and reflects his own personal journey. Uh, so a little bit about that uh, journey. Um, uh, Ignatius underwent a dramatic uh, spiritual conversion in 1521 when he was 30. And at that time, as I write, uh, there were many things in his past uh, that uh, that were painful uh, memories. Uh, his mother died when he was just a baby, and soon afterward, his father sent him away from the family home to be raised by a wet nurse. Uh, although he grew to feel at home in his nurse's family, the experiences of loss and upheaval uh, at such a young age likely took an emotional toll on the young saint. Um, what we know for certain is that Ignatius bore deep regrets for things he had brought upon himself. He would later say that before he was awakened to the love of Christ, he was a man given to worldly vanities who became a soldier so he could satisfy a vain and overpowering desire to gain renown. Those are his words. We also have his friend's account that he was reckless with games, women, and brawls. Honestly, with St. Ignatius, we are literally speaking of a saint who had an arrest record. It's true. Uh, so uh, during the year following his conversion, Ignatius began an intense period of prayer and penance. It was then that he began writing his spiritual exercises, and at the conclusion of the regime of meditations, he placed the contemplation to attain the love of God. 
Uh, the contemplation begins with two points for reflection. First, Ignatius writes, love should be manifested in deeds rather than words. Uh, second, love always cons love consists in a mutual sharing of goods. One always gives to the other. Uh, Ignatius then invites us to set the scene for the meditation. It is to behold myself standing in the presence of God our Lord and of his angels and saints who intercede for me. The object will be to ask for an intimate knowledge of the many blessings received that filled with gratitude for everything, I may in all things love and serve the divine majesty. But how exactly are we to serve the divine majesty? What is it that God desires from us? Ignatius provides the answer through the powerful words of his sushipe. This is a, a, a prayer uh, that's called the sushipe for its first word in Latin, which is take. Uh, the prayer goes, take, O Lord, and receive my entire liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my whole will, all that I am and all that I possess, you have given me. I surrender it all to you to be disposed of according to your will. Give me only your love and your grace. With these, I will be rich enough and will desire nothing more. Now, given Ignatius's sorrow over sinful choices he made during his former life, it is moving to see that the first thing he offers in the prayer is his liberty. Wanting to live for God instead of for himself, he gives up his freedom to act so that he might say with St. Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. It is yet, yet I live, no longer I, but Christ lives in me. Then comes the aspect of the sushi pay that is perhaps the most striking. Having given his freedom, Ignatius seeks to give God his mind and heart. What is the first part of his inner self that he offers? It is his memory. In Ignatius's un Ignatius understanding of the human mind, the concept of memory refers to more than just particular memories. Memory includes everything that had entered into his consciousness to make him who he was, whether or not he could actually remember it. It forms the foundation of his present identity, including his hopes for the future. This is an ancient way of understanding memory dating back at least to St. Augustine, and it makes particular sense for one who has survived trauma, as Ignatius had, having been wounded during his military days. Often in survivors of trauma, the brain attempts to protect itself by consigning painful swaths of the past to areas where memory's tendrils cannot reach them, yet the memories of traumatic events, whether present to us or not, remain part of us. That is why there is something very beautiful about St. Ignatius offering his memory to God. The saint acknowledges there are things he cannot change, the events of his past, and at the same time, displays the bold hope that his maker will accept him as he is now with everything he did and everything that was done to him. Now, I remember how arresting it was for me as a survivor of childhood sexual abuse 
when I read the words of the sushi pay for the first time, I thought, how could God possibly want my memories? I don't want my memories. I've been trying to forget them. And God wants them. But the answer is that God wants everything. Most of all, as Pope Francis says, he wants to teach us to be more loving. He wants to confirm in us the, the commitment we have made. And this is what our memory does. For memory, Francis says, is a grace of the Lord's presence in our apostolic lives. This is why Francis tells us our prayer needs to be in his words, permeated with memory. When w this is because when we unite our memories to the memory of God, who remembers us, we find our identity as children of our Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ, who suffered death and was buried and rose again. And this brings us back to the first part of Ignatius's, Ignatius's sushi pay, when he offers God his liberty. Francis observes that liberty and memory, the foundations of Ignatius's self-offering, are intimately connected. He points to a passage in the book of Deuteronomy when Moses reminds the Israelites how the Lord, after freeing them from s slavery in Egypt, provided for them during the 40 years when they were being led through the wilderness to the promised land. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, ha has Moses saying, the Lord your God fed you with manna, a food unknown to you. In this way, Pope Francis says, the scriptures urge the people to recall to remember, to memorize the entire walk through the desert in times of famine and desperation. The command of Moses, Francis continues, is to return to the basics, to the experience of total dependence on God when survival was placed in his hands so the people would understand that Man does not live by bread alone, but that man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Now, Francis goes on to say that if we dream of foods other than the bread of life, we are, in his words, like the Hebrews in the desert who longed for the meat and onions they ate in Egypt, but forgot that they had eaten those meals at the table of slavery. In those moments of temptation, they had a memory, but a sick memory, a selective memory, a slave memory, not a free one. Now, Francis's words pose a special challenge to those of us who have survived trauma. If we have been wounded by others or have endured other kinds of hardship, we may be tempted to self-pity, despair, or anger. How can we escape such thoughts based as they are upon evils of the past that cannot be undone? Francis gives us an answer with another image from Deuteronomy. The Israelites were led from slavery to freedom by God himself going before them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Francis says that we can likewise escape our slavery, uh, to our slavery to past regrets and resentments if, in Francis's words, we follow Jesus truly present in the Eucharist this is the true bread from heaven, our manna, through whom 
the Lord gives himself to us. Now, I, in remembering God's mercy, uh, what I do is I walk the reader through the uh, experience of making this offering of our memory to God, which we actually make in the offertory at every Mass. When we, through uh, an individual or two in the congregation, offer the, uh, the bread and wine, which will, through the power of Jesus Christ acting through the priest, be transubstantiated into the body and blood of Jesus, we are, as uh, Fulton Sheen speaks very eloquently when speaking on the, the, the Mass, we are really offering ourselves to be to be ourselves through the Eucharist transformed, transformed into Christ. We are already united with Christ through our baptism. We are united with Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection. And these three are one. These three, Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection, they happened in time, historically, in sequence. But together, they, they are one act. Uh, they are uh, a single act of redemption, which, uh, as John Paul II uh, liked to remind us, uh, the uh, redemption uh, is, is the, the paschal mystery, Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. And these three um, now cannot be separated. The, you can't uh, just take the passion in isolation from, from, Je from Jesus' death and resurrection. You also can't take the resurrection in isolation from the passion. They all have their redemptive value because they're a unity. And uh, th this is important because it means that when I feel any kind of uh, wound, any kind of painful memory, if I offer that wound uh, as part of my own offering, um, through the offertory and the Mass especially, but I can make this offering in union with the Mass uh, in, uh, that's going on throughout the world. I can spiritually unite myself with this sacrifice, which is Jesus' own sacrifice, at any time of the day. When I do that, offering my sufferings in union with Jesus' passion, that unites me with the dynamism that has its, uh, its culmination, its ultimate end in Jesus' resurrection. So it un unites me with the risen Jesus who still bears his wounds in heaven, but whose wounds are now glorified, radiating grace, as we see in the divine mercy image. Now, I may not feel that grace, at the moment that I make that union. And that's okay. It's okay. It's, you, you know that saying, some, uh, some uh, psychologists will say it, and it, it can be a helpful saying, it's okay to not be okay. <laughs> it's okay to not have feelings of, um, of, of um, joy in suffering. It's okay to not get a Eucharistic buzz or a post-confession buzz. Sometimes we get that buzz, and that's great. And we can thank God for that buzz. We can thank God for any consolations that we receive. But if we don't receive that, it's OK, because even in our dryness, we are united with Jesus at the deepest level. This is, um, I'm not saying that every moment of dryness is the dark night of the soul. Um, uh, but uh, I am saying that uh, in our dryness, we can experience something like, uh, akin to what St. Therese, John of the Cross, felt in their dark night, which is a union with Jesus in his agony. When Jesus uh, willed that he would go to the depths of human suffering, so he willed to deprive himself of the consolations that he normally would have experienced as part of the beatific vision. He retained the beatific vision, which is to say that he always retained a knowledge uh, of the Father 
that that he that he in his very being was the, that he, that he himself Jesus retained the knowledge that he in, in his very being was the son of the father and he and and so uh he he had that he could not deny himself but in his passion and particularly in his agony uh, in the garden he deprived himself of the consolations the feelings uh and uh, that that he would normally have had and yet we know that it is in the depth of his agony that he was yet um that he was yet closest to the father uh so so uh these are the things that i try to walk the reader through to a point where the reader can um appreciate Christ's presence in his or her s in the reader's suffering, appreciate um, Christ's presence in the reader's uh, joys and consolation, and ultimately get to the point where the reader is no longer fixated on his or her own suffering, but able to take whatever amount of consolation he or she has received um, even if it's just the smallest bit of realizing that God has been loving him or her th through all that pain, and then the reader is, at the end, able to take that, consol that cons consolation and radiate it to others, which is when, uh, as we take this message to others, uh, as people who have done the 12 steps know, uh, that 12th step of bringing the message to others is what really brings our own healing into overdrive. Uh, so uh, you've been a, a wonderful audience. It's a joy to share uh, the message of remembering God's mercy with you. Uh, and I'll be delighted to take any questions you have and afterwards to meet you and sign your books afterwards. Thank you so much, and God bless you.